the lecture for today is rotation. This lecture is going to be dedicated um, specifically to rotational motion. Uh, however, we are going to find that um, we're going to see that the same laws apply for rotational motion as they applied for linear motion with the small correction of introducing variables that are specifically defined for rotation and a few new quantities which are important for the description of rotational motion, uh, those being torque and rotational inertia. We are going to exclusively consider only rotation of rigid, bo rigid bodies because when we look at the rotation of gases or liquids, the positions of the molecules of those substances are not fixed in space with respect to an axis of rotation, so they can move in a random fashion, and therefore the laws that we are going to discuss today do not apply for those substances. So only rigid bodies, where the positions of the particle inside the volume of the body um, are fixed with respect to the axis of rotation, is what we are going to discuss today. So as I already mentioned, the rotation we are going to consider about an axis in space, and furthermore, we are going to consider the axis of rotation to be fixed in space. So the axis does not um, change orientation, it does not change position. So the, axis, uh, the fixed axis about which the object will rotate, as I already said, is called axis of rotation. And the first quantity that we are going to define is the angular position um, of a reference line, which in this cartoon here is given by this red line. And so the angular position is given by the angle which the reference line makes with a predefined direction of orientation, for example, the x-axis of a three-dimensional coordinate system, x, y, and z, where the zeroth angular position is the position of the line matching exactly the position of the x-axis, and then as the rotation happens in counterclockwise direction, the angle of rotation from the x-axis will give us the angular position. So if you look at this cartoon here on the right-hand side, this is the reference line starting from the axis of rotation, which is the z-axis coming out of the page. And then the angle of rotation is theta, and that is the angular position um, of this reference line with respect to the x-axis. When we discuss linear motion, we also introduce directionality to the motion. So positive direction of motion, negative direction of motion. So just like for linear motion, we can introduce positive direction of rotation and negative direction of rotation for rotational motion. So one more time, if we look at the cartoon here on the right hand side, the object currently is in counterclockwise rotation and that is the positive direction of rotation for our considerations. So when the angle of rotation is measured from positive x-axis in counterclockwise direction, this angle is positive. If the angle of rotation is measured from the positive x-axis in clockwise direction, then that will be a negative angle of rotation. So therefore, if we measure the angular position of um, the reference line in a direction counterclockwise from the positive x-axis, then that is a positive angular position. And if we measure the angular position of the reference line um, in direction clockwise from the positive x-axis, then that is a negative angular position. So how do we measure um, the angle of rotation or the angular position as an object rotates about a fixed axis. 
Well, I can consider the rotation of a single particle from the volume of this object about a fixed axis. So if this is the fixed axis, this is the particle as it rotates about this fixed axis, and it does one full revolution. Okay, so if I look at two positions of the particle as it goes through that one full revolution, position one and position two, then I see that the particle travels a distance s, which is the length of this arc around this circle. And then between those two points, one and two, an angle theta is enclosed. And so then if the radius of this circular trajectory is r, the relationship between the angle theta, the length of arc s, and the radius r is given by this formula here. So um, theta is equal to s divided by r. And so the measure of this angle will be in radians, and radians are the units for uh, angles in the metric system. One other important uh, detail to note is that the units of the arc length S and the radius R must be the same. So we cannot have one in centimeters, the other one in meters, or one in inches, the other one in feet. They both have, have the same units for the angle theta to be measured in radians. So then knowing that one um, full rotation around the circle is um, one revolution or also 360 degrees, um, I can then find out how many radians correspond to one full revolution, and that is 2 times pi radians. Furthermore, by definition, the angle theta will be equal to 1 radian when the length of the arc S and the radius R are equal to each other. So now a few important considerations regarding the angle of rotation theta. So once one full revolution is completed, we do not reset the angle to zero again. So for example, one full revolution is 360 degrees. Two full revolutions will be twice 360 degrees, or two times two pi radians, and so on and so forth. Also, if I know the position um, the angular position of a rotating object as a function of time, theta t, then that function will completely describe the motion of this um, object as it rotates. So also, if I know two angular positions as an object rotates, so theta 1 and theta 2, then I can also calculate the angular displacement delta theta by just simply taking the difference of the two angular positions. To reiterate one more time, the angular displacement in counterclockwise direction is positive, and the angular displacement in clockwise direction is negative. So the mnemonic rule of remembering that um, convention of signs will be that clocks are negative. So clockwise rotation negative, counterclockwise rotation positive. Now let's define some more um, rotational variables um, to describe the motion of or the rotation of an object. We will find out that the rotational variables that describe the motion of a rotating object are pretty much similar or even identical to the variables uh, describing linear motion, identical in the sense that their definitions are essentially the same, except for the variables themselves have different names to reflect the type of motion. First, let's start with average angular velocity. The average angular velocity, omega average, is defined as the angular displacement, which is the difference between two angular positions, theta 2 and theta 1, divided by the time interval between the two angular positions, so t2 minus t1. Or in other words, we write this as delta theta divided by delta t. Now, if I 
want to um, determine the angular velocity at a specific moment of time, I must set the time interval delta t approaching zero. And so then if I do that, I will get a you know, value for the angular, for the instantaneous angular velocity. So that would be the limit when delta t approaches zero of delta theta divided by delta t. We write this as d theta dt, so the time derivative of the position function, and that is the angular velocity right here. Furthermore, since we are discussing rigid bodies, remember the positions of all particles in the volume of such rigid body are fixed in space and do not change with time. So the formula that I just derived and also the formula for angular displacement apply for all points or all particles inside of a rigid body. The magnitude of the angular velocity is called angular speed. The units for angular velocity or angular speed would be radians per second. The calculation of the average angular velocity is shown schematically in this figure. So we have our reference line with red here, and then we have rotation um, in counterclockwise direction. So the initial angular position is given by theta 1. The final angular position is given by theta 2. The difference between the two angular positions is the angular displacement. And when the uh, reference line was at position theta 1, the time uh, stamp was t1. When the reference line was at position theta 2, the time stamp is theta 2. And so then it is pretty straightforward to calculate the average angular velocity simply as the difference between the two angular positions divided by the difference between the two time, time stamps or basically the time interval between two uh, positions of the reference line. Furthermore, I can now also define angular acceleration. First, we start with the average angular acceleration. We label that with alpha average. That would be the difference between two values of the angular velocity as the object rotates, so omega 2 minus omega 1, divided by the time interval between those two values for the angular velocity, or in other words, the, angular, the average angular acceleration is just equal to delta omega divided by delta t. I can then um, modify the definition to find an expression for the instantaneous angular acceleration, that would be the angular acceleration at a specific moment of time. For this, I'm going to set delta t to approach zero. So I'm shrinking the time interval between the two angular velocity values. And so then the instantaneous angular acceleration alpha is going to be equal to the time derivative of the angular velocity, the omega dt. The units for angular acceleration in the metric system would be radians per second squared. Again, since we are dealing with rigid bodies, the equations for the angular acceleration, for the average and for the instantaneous, apply for all points or all particles in the rigid body. The angular velocity and angular acceleration are vector quantities, while the angular displacements are not vector quantities because of the order of uh, rotation as a is related to different axes of rotation. So how are the angular velocity and angular acceleration vectors directions determined? Let's look at the rotation of, let's say, a single particle about a fixed axis. So the fixed axis is here, and then the rotation is in counterclockwise direction. All right, so the way to determine the direction of the angular velocity in uh, for any rotation about a fixed axis is to use the right-hand rule. So the right-hand rule states that if I wrap the fingers of my right hand in the direction of rotation, then the thumb of my right hand will point in the direction of the angular uh, 
velocity vector. So in this particular example, since the rotation is in counterclockwise direction, if I wrap the fingers of my right hand in counterclockwise direction, in the direction of rotation, my thumb points up, and that is the direction of the angular velocity vector. What about the angular acceleration vector? The direction of the angular acceleration vector can be determined by the um, the way the angular velocity vector changes. For example, if the angular velocity vector increases with time, so the object is speeding up as it rotates, then that means that the angular acceleration is in the same direction as the angular velocity. Just like that. So the angular acceleration is in the same direction with the angular velocity, therefore the angular velocity as a vector is going to increase in magnitude. If the angular velocity is decreasing by magnitude, that means that the direction of the angular acceleration is opposite to the direction of the angular velocity. And so then the angular velocity vector will be decreasing by magnitude. Since the quantities that describe the motion of an object as it rotates, or the rotational motion of an object, um, we defined angular displacement, angular velocity, angular acceleration. That means that kinematically we can describe that rotational motion with the same equations that we used for linear kinematics, except for we just need to replace linear velocity, linear acceleration, and linear displacement with their angular counterparts. And so here in this table, we have the list of equations from linear kinematics. And on the right hand side, we have the list of equations from rotational kinematics. So all the variables are now rotational variables. So the same equations apply, but with the corresponding rotational variables. What is the relationship between linear and rotational variables. The relationship is very simple, and it comes through the radius of rotation. So, for example, the position theta is defined as the ratio of the arc length s and the radius r of rotation. So, from here, I could rewrite this relationship as the length of arc s is equal to the angle of rotation times the radius of rotation. And so if I take the time derivative, uh, ds dt, on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, I'm going to get d theta dt, and that will be the only variable that will uh, undergo the derivative because the radius does not change with time. Remember, in a rigid body, every particle is fixed in space. But from linear kinematics, now I remember that the S dt is just the time derivative of the displacement, and that is the uh, instantaneous velocity v. So on the left-hand side, I have the instantaneous velocity v. And then on the right-hand side, we just discussed that d theta dt is just the instantaneous angular velocity. So the linear velocity of a particle inside the rigid body which rotates is equal to the product of the angular velocity of that particle and the distance from the axis of rotation, the radius of the circular trajectory of that particle. One other important consideration in regards to the relationship between the linear velocity and the angular velocity of a particle as it rotates is that for a collection of particles in the volume of a rigid body, all particles rotate with the same angular velocity because all of them must turn through the same angle theta as the rotation is happening. But depending on the distance from the axis of rotation, different particles can have different linear velocities. So again, the angular velocities for all particles in the rigid body are the same, but the linear velocities of those particles can be different 
and that depends on the distance from the axis of rotation r. So now let's look at one more important consideration. So we know that the angular velocity is measured in radians per second. We know that in the metric system, the distance from the axis of rotation will be measured in meters. And so then the linear velocity here would have units of radians per second times meters. There is a bit of a problem here because that is not the same as meters per second, as we know the unit for the uh, linear velocity must be. So what is the problem here? Well, there is no problem. So radians were the units for was the unit for rotation in the metric system, and that was defined as the ratio of length of arc divided by the length of the radius. So that basically has a measure of um, length divided by length. So that means it is dimensionless. So essentially, the radian is like a placeholder unit to indicate that we are in the metric system. And so then there is no problem with the unit for the um, linear velocity here because the radian is a dimensionless unit. And so really the two um, expressions here for the units are the same thing. We discussed previously how to figure out or how to calculate the period of rotation for an object when uh, the object rotates with some linear velocity v. And that would be 2 pi r, which is the circumference of the trajectory divided by the velocity v. Now, through the relationship between the linear velocity v and the angular velocity omega, I can rewrite the period as 2 pi divided by the angular velocity omega. And now that would have um, units in you know, seconds again, just like before, but now the calculation is in terms of quantities, the angular velocity, that is, with measures of radians per second. Consider now the rotation of a rigid body, and so point P inside the volume of the body rotates around this circular trajectory, but this velocity here changes in magnitude as well. So the speed essentially changes as the rotation is progressing. So that means that the velocity is a function of time, and therefore, if I start with the relationship between the linear velocity and the angular velocity, which we discussed on the previous slide, and take the time derivative on both sides, then the left-hand side, the VDT, will give me the acceleration with which the linear velocity of this point P changes, and I will call that tangential, tangential acceleration, AT. On the left-hand side, I get the omega dt, which is the definition of the angular acceleration. So I get a relationship between linear acceleration and rotational acceleration. So the tangential acceleration, the tangential acceleration of point P is equal to the angular acceleration of rotation times the radius of rotation the trajectory of P, or the distance for, from the axis of rotation to where point P is. We are already familiar with the expression for the radial acceleration of point P. Why is there radial acceleration? Because the point undergoes rotational motion, so that means that there must be an acceleration component towards the axis of rotation, and that is the radial acceleration, AR. We know that this angular acceleration can be calculated as the linear velocity of point P to the second power divided by the distance from the axis of rotation, R, 
And now if I use one more time the relationship between V omega and R, I can rewrite the radio acceleration AR as omega squared times R. If I combine the two acceleration, the tangential acceleration AT and the radio acceleration AR, I can write an expression for the total acceleration of point P. And that will look like the Pythagorean theorem essentially for the two vectors the tangential acceleration vector and the radio acceleration vector. So the magnitude of the total acceleration A is equal to square root of AT squared plus AR squared. Let's discuss now the kinetic energy of rotation. And we are going to first start with the kinetic energy of rotation of a single particle about a fixed axis of rotation. So here is the axis of rotation. Here is my particle. It has mass mi, it rotates around this fixed axis, the distance from the fixed axis is r, and I am going to assign velocity v sub i for this particle as it rotates about the fixed axis. I'm also going to re... Um, I'm going to also label the distance from the axis of rotation r with ri since if i'm going to consider more particles that distance will change depending on where the particles are with respect to the axis of rotation so one more time we have a particle with mass mi that rotates about a fixed axis right here the distance from the axis of rotation is ri and the speed of rotation is vi okay so then i can write an expression for the kinetic energy of this particle, Ki is equal to Mi Vi squared divided by 2. Well, I can consider a rigid body which contains an infinite number of particles, if you will, and for each particle I can write that same expression where the index will change according to the number of the particle in the rigid body. Well, I can also add all of these expressions and then I'm going to end up with this sum right here. So the total kinetic energy will be equal to the sum of the kinetic energy terms of each of all particles in the rigid body. Now the challenge is to transition from kinetic energy expression in terms of linear velocity to a kinetic energy expression in terms of angular velocity. So simply I'm going to use the relationship between the linear velocity and the angular velocity uh, one more time. So Vi is equal to omega i times Ri. And I'm going to replace this in the expression here where v i squared is. So what I'm going to get is this result right here. So the kinetic energy became the sum of one half m i times omega r i squared. So why did I miss or did I not write the index i for the angular velocity? Because, just to remind you, all particles in the rigid body must rotate the same angle for the same amount of time, so all of them have the same angular velocity omega. So that means that my index right here is unnecessary. So now I'm going to rearrange the terms and I'm going to shift the parentheses so that I have the sum of mi times ri squared grouped together. And this quantity here, mi times ri squared, the sum of those terms, is known as the rotational inertia or the moment of inertia i. So this term here, as you can see, depends on the mass the total mass of the rigid body and also 
it depends on the distance of each mass element, each particle's mass, from the axis of rotation to the second power. So this gives us a mass distribution dependence of the moment of inertia. So it depends where the mass of the rigid body is located or how it is located around the axis of inertia and, uh, sorry, around the axis of rotation. And so the moment of inertia for the same amount of mass can vary based on how the mass is distributed around the axis of rotation. So this quantity is dependent on the mass distribution. That's the most important uh, thing that we must remember about that moment of inertia. Why do we have this importance? Because if we look at the rotation of an object about a certain fixed axis, we are going to calculate the moment of inertia based on how the mass is distributed around that axis of rotation. But if we all of a sudden change the axis of rotation, or rather select a different axis of rotation, then the mass distribution will change based on the distance between each mass element to the axis of rotation. Therefore, the moment of inertia will change as well. The units for moment of inertia will be kilograms times meters squared in the metric system. And so to summarize, the rotational inertia or the moment of inertia I is equal to the sum of the, um, the products of the mass of each particle in the rigid body and the distance squared to the axis of rotation. And then if I replace that or substitute that in the expression for the kinetic energy from the previous slide, the kinetic, kinetic energy of rotation or rotational kinetic energy is one half I omega squared. So what is the meaning of rotational inertia? Well, rotational inertia essentially has the same role for rotational motion as mass has for linear motion. We know that mass is... Uh, related to inertia. So a heavy object has large inertia and that makes it hard to move or hard to change the way it's moving already, as opposed to a light object which has small inertia and it's easy to move or change the way that that object moves. So then rotational inertia is a quantity, as we already said, that depends on mass distribution. So an object with small rotational inertia would be easy to rotate or change the way it rotates, as opposed to an object with large rotational inertia, which will be hard to uh, rotate or change the way it rotates already. The expression for the rotational inertia from the previous slide was written for a discrete distribution of particles. So when we have a number of particles that are distributed in a certain way around a fixed axis of rotation, how do we express the moment of inertia when we have a continuous body? Well, we, need, we must integrate. And so the definition of the moment of inertia for a continuous mass distribution is given by this integral. So that's an integral of r squared dm, where dm would be the mass of a small mass element inside the um, volume of the continuous you know, rigid body. The good news is that the moments of inertia for various symmetric shapes have been calculated. And those are shown in this table. And so we have the moment of inertia for a hoop about an axis that passes to the center for a thick cylinder for about an axis passes to the center, for a solid cylinder about an axis passes through, passing through the center, for a solid cylinder about an axis passes through the middle like that, and so on and so forth. So the moments of inertia for various symmetric shapes are known. So when we are solving problems involving the calculation of a moment of inertia, we can, uh, of a complex shape, we can break it down into um, simple shapes such as cylinders, spheres, uh, slabs, or um, shells, or rings, and we can calculate the individual moments of inertia and then add all results together to get the total moment of inertia of the entire complex shape. An interesting question arises when we want to calculate the moment of inertia about an axis that does not pass through the center of mass of a continuous body, uh, 
but we know the moment of inertia about an axis that passes through the center of mass. So we know the moment of inertia of the, of the body about the center of mass, but we want the moment of inertia about an axis that passes through a different point. So as the cartoon here shows, this is the center of mass of this continuous body. And so uh, the axis of rotation here passes, basically is along the z-axis as it's coming out of the page. But I want to find the moment of inertia about an axis that passes to point P right here. So what do I do? Well, I can use the parallel axis theorem, which states that the moment of inertia about an axis that passes through any point in space is equal to the moment of inertia about an axis that passes through the center of mass plus the total mass of the body times the distance h between, so h is here, between the axis passing through the center of mass and the axis in question to the second power. So if the distance between the axis of rotation that I'm interested in and the axis that passes through the center of mass is h, then the moment of inertia about the axis that passes through point P is equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass plus the mass of the entire body times the distance between the two axes squared. It is important to keep in mind that the two axes must be parallel to each other and that we must know the moment of inertia about the axis that passes through the center of mass. So this formula, this theorem, does not apply for two randomly oriented axes. It only applies for two parallel axes. And one of them must be going through the center of mass. So here we have an example um, of a system of two masses, which are identical, that are located equal distance from an axis of rotation, which passes through the center of mass of this system of particles. So if I wanted to calculate the uh, moment of inertia of that system, I would then calculate that as the sum mi r r squared, which would be m times L over 2 with the minus sign to the second power that corresponds to this particle on the left side of the axis of rotation. Then I'm going to add the term that corresponds to the particle on the right side of the axis of rotation. So m times L over 2 to the second power. And then when I add the 2, I get 2 times m L squared over 4. So that is m L squared over 2. So that is I come. That is the moment of inertia about an axis that passes through the center of mass, this axis right here. Okay, now I want to calculate the moment of inertia about an axis that passes through that particle m. And this axis is obviously parallel to the axis that passes through the center of mass. So, since I already know the moment of inertia about the center of mass, I can apply the parallel axis theorem to calculate the moment of inertia about this new axis right here. So the parallel axis theorem says that the moment of inertia in question is equal to the moment of inertia about the center of mass plus the total mass of the system times the distance between the moment of inertia times the distance between the new axis of rotation and the axis that passes through the center of mass to the second power. 
So the first term right here is the moment of inertia about the center of mass, which I already calculated right here. And then the second term is the total mass of the system, which is twice m, multiplied by the distance between the new axis and the axis that goes that passes to the center of mass. So that is L divided by 2, so L over 2 to the second power. When you calculate this sum, you're going to get this result. This theorem provides a powerful tool to calculate the moment of inertia about any axis that is parallel to the axis that passes to the center of mass. When using the table from the previous slide, with the known values for the moments of inertia of various symmetric geometric shapes. Let's make a small correction. Here in the calculation for the moment of inertia about the center of mass, I took the distance from the axis of rotation with a negative sign. However, that is not necessary because we do not have positive and negative directions defined here. This is simply a positive um, value. Let's now discuss the concept of torque. So torque is a quantity that arises when force is applied to an object and as a result the object will rotate or starts to rotate. So here is a force F applied at point P which is on the surface of a rigid body and this rigid body can rotate about an axis that passes through this point O. The distance from point O to point P is R, and the position is given by the position vector R. And furthermore, the force F is at an angle phi with respect to the line on which the position vector R um, lies. So then I can resolve the force F into two components with respect to the line on which the radius or the position vector r is uh, lying. So I have a radial component of the force vector fr and I have a tangential component of the force vector ft. So um, since the rigid body is fixed to rotate about this point O, that means that the radial component of the force F cannot cause rotation because it is directed along the same line that uh, connects to the axis of rotation. That is the same as trying to open or close a door by pulling your, you know, the handles uh, away from the hinges. You're not going to be able to move the door at all. However, the tangential component FT will definitely cause rotation. So then what is Ft equal to? Ft is equal to F sine of phi. So then I can multiply the magnitude of the position vector R by Ft. What do I get? I get r times f times sine of phi, where again, that's the angle between uh, the direction of r and the direction of f. Well, this quantity is known as torque. So torque is equal to the product of the magnitude. The magnitude of the torque is equal to the product of the magnitude of the position vector and the, compo the radial component of the force, the for I'm sorry, the tangential component of the force, the component that is perpendicular to the position vector. So a little bit of terminology. The line on which the force F lies is called the line of action of the force F. And then the distance perpendicular to the line of action to the force F from the axis of rotation is called the moment arm. The units for torque are newton meters.
and this is not to be this is not to be uh, confused with the units for work which were joules but on another on another hand the work was the product of force and displacement which would also have units of newton meters so when we discuss torque we always refer to the units as newton meters when we discuss work we always refer to the units as joules so when we see two quantities one in joules and one in newton meters we can tell the difference as to which quantity we are talking about if we look at the definition of torque with the magnitude of the position vector and the component of the force, it is essentially the definition of a cross product. So that means that torque is a vector quantity. So the torque is equal to the product of the magnitude of the position vector and the tangential component of the force but if you remember a cross product, the magnitude of a cross product was defined as the magnitude of the first vector times the magnitude of the second vector times sine of the angle between the two vectors. So here they are. So this definition here of torque resembles the definition of cross product very much. And so torque is a vector quantity. In the next lecture, next chapter, we are going to discuss this a little bit more in depth. However, Due to the fact that torque is a vector quantity, we must talk about directions. And so remember that at the beginning of the lecture, I talked about direction of rotation, counterclockwise being positive and clockwise being negative. Well, that applies for torques as well. So torque is positive if it would ca uh, cause counterclockwise uh, rotation, and torque is negative if it would cause clockwise rotation. So here are the two conditions for positive torque that causes counterclockwise rotation and negative torque that causes clockwise rotation. So then how do we calculate the net torque? Well, the net torque is the resultant torque and that is the sum of all torques that are present uh, during the rotation of the rigid body. So we add all the clockwise torques, we add all the counterclockwise torques and then the net torque is going to be whatever it is. It can be a zero, it can be different than zero. Now I can rewrite the second law from its linear motion form, F equals to MA, to its rotational motion form in terms of torques. So first I will start with multiplying both sides of the second law by R where R is understood to be the distance from the axis of rotation for a particle inside the body of a rotating you know, object. Here the acceleration A is the tangential acceleration that is responsible for the tangential component of, that is due to the tangential component of the applied force F then I remember that there is a relationship between the tangential acceleration A and the angular acceleration alpha, and that relationship is given by this formula. So A is equal to alpha times R. So I'm going to take that and substitute here in the second law. So after regrouping the terms, on the left-hand side, I get the product of the force and the distance from the axis of rotation. On the right-hand side, I get the mass of the a moving object or particle times the distance from the axis of rotation to the second power times the angular acceleration. Well, the product in the parentheses is the moment of inertia. And then on the left-hand side, this product FR is just the torque. And so then that's how I arrive at the result that is in the formula here. So the net torque is equal to the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. And this here is the second law form for rotational motion. As you can see from our previous mapping between linear and angular um, variables, the net torque essentially plays the same role for rotation as the net force plays for linear motion. And again, the moment of inertia plays the same role as the mass, 
in the angular acceleration obviously plays the same role as the linear acceleration. From the parallels between linear orientation and motion, now I can also draw another parallel, which is the uh, work end um, energy theorem for rotational motion. So we know from previous discussions that the change in kinetic energy for an object is equal to the work done by a external force that acts on the object. And so the change in kinetic energy is equal to some final value of the kinetic energy minus some initial value of the kinetic energy. This is the final value of the kinetic energy expressed in linear variables. This is the initial value of the kinetic energy expressed in linear variables. But I can also rewrite the two velocities, the linear velocities in terms of angular velocity and distance from axis of rotation. So this is the relationship. So if I substitute the two linear velocities in the final and initial kinetic energy expressions with the product of angular velocity and distance from axis of rotation, and use the relationship omega r squared equal to i, then I arrive at this expression right here. So the change in kinetic energy in rotational variables is given by one half i omega final squared minus one half i omega initial squared. And that is equal to the work done on the rotating object. So the work done um, in a rotation about about the fixed axis can be calculated by this formula. So the work is an integral from some initial value of the angular uh, position to some final value of the angular position of the torque, d theta. The question is, how do we arrive at that expression if we do not know the torque? But let's say we know the force that's applied to the object to make it spin. So first we start with the definition of work done by a uh, force, f. So that would be the integral of between two positions, x initial and x final, of f dx. Okay, so if I look at rotation, this is my zero position. So the initial angular position is theta initial right here. Then the object continues to rotate. This point gets to that other angular position, theta f. All, both are measured from the zero angular position right here. The distance between the axis of rotation and the position of this point is r, and the arc length between the two angular positions is the x. So from the relationship between the angle, the uh, arc length, and the radius, I then can write that the x is equal to r d theta. Furthermore, f times dx, which is this term here in the integral, can be rewritten as f times r times d theta, so f r d theta. And now we must remember the definition of torque, which was force times moment arm right here. And of course, we assume that the force is perpendicular to uh, the radius of this circle. And so then we end with rewriting f dx as tau d theta. So if I um, plug this in the integral right here, and of course, since I have rotation now, I change the integration limits from x i to x f into theta i to theta f, I get this expression for the work done in rotation. So the work done in rotation is this integral of tau of tau d theta from theta initial to theta final. This formula here applies for torque that varies with time. In general, we are going to be dealing with torques that are constant, and then this simplifies to this simple relationship the work done is equal to the torque times the angular displacement.
finally, a um, few words about power in rotation. So power is defined as the time derivative of the work done. And so the work done is calculated as torque times angular displacement. And so the time derivative of the angular displacement is equal to the angular velocity. So therefore, the power in rotation generated during rotation is equal to torque times angular velocity. And here, this last table lists all the quantities that are pertinent to linear kinematics and dynamics and their counterparts for rotational kinematics and dynamics. And with this, I conclude this lecture.